Hey, I'm Nerd and Geek Brethren. It's me, C.K. Helms, and I'm the host of the Good Stuff Podcast, which comes out every Thursday. You might know me from the hit web series Gotham Knights, where I play the Red Hood. Stay out of my way, Green. What about me, C.K.? Am I not important? Yes, Gary, you're important too, but as I told you, you're like a sidekick, not a co-host. But anyways, if you like all nerd and geek-like stuff, then you're going to like the Good Stuff Podcast. We also talk to local entertainment people. If you want to be on the Good Stuff Podcast, then email us, goodstuffpodcastyahoo.com. Like the Facebook page and listen to us on iTunes and Podbean. Thanks, guys. We'll see you every Thursday. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Southern Fried Geekery Podcast. And if I'm not mistaken, if I'm looking at everything right, this is episode 56. So it's been a minute since we've been doing this. Uh, as usual, I'm Caleb Alexander McKenzie. I'm Craig Lance. I'm Sean. And I'm Jerry. And I'm glad you're back this week, Jerry. We All missed right. you last week, buddy. Yeah. Um, I'm here. I'm yeah. back. Everything go okay? Yeah. Uh, Steph came in town and we hung out and stuff. Nice. Did you get a chance to listen to the episode last week? I haven't yet, but I'm pretty excited to. Yeah, I want you to. good things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, We had a special guest on. It was Lily, who is a regular on our Facebook page, on our social media stuff. Did an awesome job. Did a really awesome job. So if she listens, I'm sure she's going to listen to this episode. I just want to reiterate that. We're glad she came on. We had a great time. Uh, It was fun. It was was great having that that perspective on here. Yeah, for Uh, sure. The feminine perspective. We don't get a lot of that. Uh, well, I mean, we get close. <laughs> hey, hey. Oh, was that not at me? Okay. No, that was okay. Jerry. <laughs> well, welcome back, Jerry. <laughs> so this week we are, it's kind of a, we, we told you guys a little bit in the last two weeks how we're switching up our format a little bit. We're going in a kind of different, not a different direction. We're just doing things differently. Uh, we're breaking up the old format to be able to talk about things, go a little bit more in depth on what things are, talk about the news, talk about the books. Um, so last week was one of our smothered covered in comic episodes. So we dived right into the comics and that's all it was for 90 minutes or so. Uh, just good, good comic talk. Had a great time. This week we are doing something a little bit different. This is going to be a news episode. So instead of d- dropping, talking about news every single episode, we're going to make it a once a month thing and kind of cover the big things that happen. That way, it's there, there's a lot of interesting things happen. We can have the space, the time, and the nuance to really get into what it is. And then we're going to drop a we're going to do a roundtable. So you're you're not you're not getting away from comics completely because that'd be boring, right? Nobody wants to not talk about comics, at least on this show. <laughs> and then we're going to talk about some anime. Uh, so it's going to be a fun show. So let's kind of just get into it. You guys doing okay? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. All right. Good. So let's roll right into this. So the first thing this week uh, actually happened this week that we want to talk about. And that is a legendary comic artist. Uh, Mr. George Perez announced his retirement um, on his own terms. And I want to say when I first saw this, I was a little bit sad. Um, So for those of you who have listened to the show before, George is my goat. And by that, I mean greatest of all time. Like I realize across the grand scale, there are people that, you know, would consider other artists to be the greatest. George is my guy. He's his run on the Avengers is what really sucked me into comics. I absolutely love everything he's done. I even collected the George Perez sirens from Boom Studios. Uh, <laughs> and the, I think I would might have been the only person. No, I collected it. too. Oh, did you? OK, yeah. cool. And that was actually his last published yeah. work in 2016. So um, the news is news, but it's not right. Gra- it was, groundbreaking. It's news. one of those things that we kind of all expected, I think. Um, but when I say he's going out on his own terms. So George has been having some health issues. Over the past several years, his eyesight's getting bad. His wife is also having some health issues. And so he he just came out and was like, look, um, you know, I'm I'm getting tired. I'm he's into his upper sixties, he's pushing seventy. Yeah. Um, he's like, you know, I've I've got these medical issues. I'm reaching retirement age. I, I don't want to be one of these guys who is ninety years old and like having to do the grind to pay my bills. and, and I don't have to be. So I'm kind of checking out now. He's he's saying that he's not doing any new published comics work, which, like you said, Craig, he hasn't really done since 2016 anyway. Right. Um, he's going to start dialing back on his uh, convention appearances. Yeah. He said he's uh, finishing up the ones he's already locked in for. Yeah. And he'll be doing maybe like a limited number of sketches for at the con. Yeah. Five. Yeah. Yep. But now, but uh, he's 
This is his, uh, you know, going home show. Right. And yeah, well deserved. Absolutely. Honest. Yeah. It, it's good to see. It's good to see an artist of that caliber, like getting the royalty checks, being financially solvent enough to. What was that? I, there was squeaking. <laughs> it's Apollo playing with the toy. Okay, that's not, that's all not good. <laughs> Apollo's to, our new puppy. I, I just want to play with him for hours. <laughs> um, but no, it's really cool seeing an artist of that caliber having the financial solvency to be able to make that call himself, right? Know, instead absolutely. of having to be just up in age and still just playing the art game and doing it just to pay his bills at home. So I mean, yeah, I mean you. Can't deny he's he's paid his dues. He's earned his. I mean, he's going out one last little go home show. Is, yeah, is great. I mean, the man. He's the one that drew me into uh, New Teen Titans. Yeah, I mean that's his work on that. To me, is like I said, I never read his Avengers run, uh, like, but your Avengers is my. New I'm gonna Teen make Titans. you. I'm gonna lock yeah. you into a bunker until you read it. <laughs> well, so the thing about George Perez is he was just absolutely was probably. I mean, still is, but a fantastic artist, and he really had a style that you could pinpoint oh for sure i I look at books and i can almost immediately tell if it's a george perez book or not which saying is saying something for the time when he was really popular because a lot of them did house style books back then whether it was marvel or dc they kind of tried to do what fit into the style that was being required of them Mm -hmm. but his still stood out yeah even though it was kind of the house style it still stood out you can you can usually it's the hair that gives it yep, away that big yeah. big eighties hair, but oh, yeah. you can usually tell when you look at a book and it's a George Perez book. And um, I think the biggest thing here is he's having a hard time seeing anymore. Yeah, right. it's really hard to be an artist and go to a show and do commissions at a show when you're having a hard time seeing. Mm-hmm. So he's doing as Sean said he's going to do some sketches, which he's going to like you said five to show, but he's going to. Take that money and give it to charity. Yeah, I think so, it's the hero initiative that he yeah. said he was giving it to. Yeah, so, yeah. which is like I said, he's, phenomenal. And he's doing it smart because, like I said, he knows he can't push himself anymore due to his conditions. Yeah, uh, he was saying basically, like he like said, five commissions that have to be put in in advance. Yeah, that way he can work on them before the show. You just collect them at the convention mm-hmm. he's going to be yep. at. It's a smart move, and like I said, man, the man deserves a rest. Not only that, but if you're only doing a limited number of con sketches, um, so you know we go to a lot of cons, and a lot of times the artists that are there are busy like they're yeah, super, yeah. like they're trying to sign people's books they're doing commissions yeah. and they're also trying to talk to the customers as they come up but a lot of times it's you know they they have their head down and they're working and they're trying to they're multitasking now George can just like sit back and I mean you know I think you have to kind of make a comparison to the Stan Lee you know Stan in his golden years uh you know did a lot where he just shuffled through people signing books as many as possible um George cannot do that. George can kick back and throw his feet in the ottoman and just like communicate with people who come up and yeah. just want to shake his hand. I, well, I think that's rad. And I have a feeling he's going to continue to do yeah. um cons at a lesser amount uh but do them in a way where he can just like you said he's just going to sign books and right. and not have to worry about the stress of the con which For sure. as as I mean artists are always busier than the than the Writers, writers at yeah. a, a convention because writers are just signing books and they talk for a minute or whatever. But the right, the artists always stay. So just unless slam. you're a oh crap, who is it? I think it's a writer you follow. They always ask him to do drawings. They're always like, crap, oh, Tom Snyder or no, Tom, Tom King. Oh, that was uh, uh, who is it? Tom King. Is Tom yeah. King? Okay, I wasn't yeah. sure. I know like you, you shared some of his tweets about like <laughs> I'm a writer, but they want me to do drawings. Yeah, so, that's great. They must start going up to writers and be like, hey, can you dish me out a script for like a fifty dollars script real quick? <laughs> <laughs> they they did that. They did that. Uh, they started doing that to other writers too, and I think Donny right. Cates got in on it as well. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, when it when it's all said and done for all that stuff, though, I feel like they just need to pay these guys more, or else they wouldn't have to work themselves all the way to where they couldn't work anymore. You know. Well, and that's where a lot of your creator-owned work is going. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it, it is at the end of the day, it's corporate work. When you talk about the big two and Marvel and who who owns what, and then you look back at the work done by Kirby and you know Alan Moore and all those guys who have weird uh their, their the rights to their characters are tied up and they're not getting the royalties that arguably they should have but right. again arguably this is a business and you should have a lawyer look at your contracts and make yeah. sure that e- even if so so my stuff that I write um even if it's stuff I'm having printed in a a free magazine um, I still have the rights to that, and I still make sure that contractually I get those rights to that, even though I don't think I'll ever be a famous writer one day, because you well, just don't know. So in the corporate world, if you work for somebody, your intellectual property while you're at work belongs to them. Mm-hmm. So if you're doing work for a corporate company 
and you're drawing X-Men ZY2 and that character becomes huge, your only way you're going to make money off of it is to go to conventions and charge for signatures and to draw that character over and over again because you're under a contract Mm -hmm. to create those characters for the the corporations yeah. and those intellectual properties don't belong to you. Yeah, you're playing, you're playing in is. somebody else's sand. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the whole reason image got created. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. And that's the image model. A lot of people are, are, that's the end game now instead of like the foot in the door. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, um, it used to be the other way. You do the right. creator own stuff to get your foot in the door to sh- show your work so you could get hired at Marvel or DC. Now it's the other way. People go to work for Marvel and yeah, DC. Yeah, now Marvel so and DC is like the testing ground to mm-hmm. get into right. your own. Build the name so you can do your own creator now, own stuff. Just before we get through talking about him have any of y'all ever had a chance to meet him have y'all had a chance to i meet have George? not he was going to be at memphis a couple yeah. years ago and then um he canceled all of his southern tour mm-hmm. because of the political environment at the time so i did not go to memphis I, he was the only reason why i was yeah. going to go that year uh, i haven't would love to always oh, here he's a really nice guy uh he's, like i said he's my He's my guy, um, and I bought tickets to go to New York Comic Con in 2012 because he was going to be there, and because of health reasons, he had to back out. I went to Dallas to see him, and he had to back out because of oh, health reasons. Uh, Memphis, I didn't get to go to the Memphis show because I had to work. Um, I was gone in another state to work, and he's supposed to be at C2E2 this year, so oh, this is kind of my luck. last. Fingers crossed. Uh, I'm going to just crawl. Like, I'm going to camp. I'm going to take a tent <laughs> and just be just in the convention. Yeah, and stay there till yeah, I meet uh, We'll have to look into how much he's charging for signatures. I'll probably have to send you with a new Teen Titans book. I, I may do it, man. If you if you can get it to me, I'll, yeah. I'll definitely absolutely do it. All right, so the Eisner Hall of Fame nominations came out this week, and that's kind of the next it's thing. It's a big list. It is. So let's kind of dig into this. So if you don't know what the Eisners are, um, if you're new to comics or if you just haven't ever paid attention to the, the professional side of the work, the Eisners are essentially the Grammys, the Golden Globes, the Oscars of comics. Uh, there, there are very few awards that have the prestige that these these awards have. Um, and so every year they come out with a list of, of Eisner award winners, but they also come out with a hall of fame. It's kind of like the rock and roll hall of fame that a committee comes up with a list of names and four of them get in. Right. Absolutely. And then the rest of them will be voted on by committee. Right. Right. Um, so do we want to, um, I've got the list of names here. Does anybody else have? I say we just, uh, yeah, we, we go through the names and then we'll, uh, we'll discuss them just a little bit and let's not spend too long on each one because it's, it's a long list. So So the the first one I'll do, we'll start with the four that are going to be automatically inducted, the judges choices. And the first one is the legendary Jim Aparo. And this just makes me happy to see him getting in there. The dude, you know, he started off his work on Charlton Comics. Unfortunately, he won't. He's he's not alive to really enjoy the fruits of the labor. Uh, He passed away in 2005. I think it was. The, the guy worked on everything, but just really, really a legendary DC creator. Yeah. Uh, you know, when I think of his name, I think about Aquaman. I think about the brave and the bold. It's just. Yeah. He did the, you know, uh, he did the art for uh, death in the family. Oh yeah, he did. I forgot about yeah, that. Yeah, death absolutely. In the family. For that work alone, that should be in the one. hall of fame. Yeah, absolutely. yeah. Just, just a huge influence. The next one is Miss June Tarpe Mills. I think is, I think it's Tarpe. That's Ju- how I say it. June is one of those legendary female creators that, you, you don't hear enough about. Yeah. yeah. And it, especially for the golden age. Oh, uh, uh, c- completely. Yeah. And it just, again, I guess all of these things, I'm going to use the phrase warms my heart. So I guess it's kind of redundant, <laughs> but, uh, you know, she, she was a groundbreaker. Um, she was shattered through the glass ceiling before we knew there was a glass ceiling. And unfortunately I think it got uh restructured beneath her, uh, to where it blocked some other women. But, you know, she did stuff like Mick, Miss Fury in the fifties. Uh, and, I, I that love book it. ran for 10 years. It started yeah. in the 40s and ran into the early 50s. It ran for 10 years. And for a creator, uh, a female creator to have a book that lasted that long back in that time is oh, pretty amazing. Absolutely. And full disclosure, I've never read any of those books, but no. I have like in my encyclopedia of comics and this, mm-hmm. that, and the other. I've just looked at all the things that they've talked about that she's touched on and just truly an inspiration. Absolutely. Um, sure. The next one is a name that we goddamn well better all know uh, <laughs> because it's Dave Stevens. And I, I mean, say Dave the Stevens. The from Hanna-Barbera, right? Not, no. It is, actually. Is it really? Yeah. Did he do that? Yeah, he did Hanna Barbera work too. No shit, yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> That's not what he's known for in the comic world. Well, no, he's yeah. known for the Rocketeer, but now yeah. I want to know what the Rocketeer meets Hanna Barbera looks yeah, like. Yeah, he did animation for uh, Hanna Barbera for years. Uh, just, just, I mean, integral 
in, in integral to the the comics medium. Yeah, for uh, sure. The work he did, and directly inspired by Eisner himself, I think you should, it's safe to say. Yeah. Which you know, who's not? But very pulp style for the eighties, I mean, for yeah. sure. Created the Rocketeer. Yep. Yeah. And then, like I'm seeing right here, he uh, his first working gig was working on Tarzan with Russ Manning. Mm-hmm. And he also did uh, storyboards uh, for animation for Hanna Barbera and uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark and Michael Jackson's Thriller music video. I did not. Know. He worked on Thriller too. Yeah, he did yeah, storyboards really? and plot out the video for. Uh, I can't. The director escapes me right now, but we were just talking about him. The mm, uh, Palma. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You lose me when you talk about video and music. I mean, that's just not my world. Whatever. <laughs> I, didn't that, did, Vincent Price did the intro to that. I knew he, that. That's he, a fun fact. I know. Yeah, he did the rap in it. He also did the intro for uh, Number of the Beast. Putting a gold star in our caps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Vincent Price should do. Should have done more intros before he died. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, including one for us, I'm a little jealous about it. Why don't we have a too late surprise intro? That, that well, we can amazing. we can steal one from Thriller or from <laughs> Number of the Beast, <laughs> and or the from la- the Thirteen Ghosts of Scooby Doo. Ooh, that's the one. That's yeah. it. That's the next one right there. All right. So the last name on this list is uh, Maury Turner. Uh, Maury Turner created the Wee Pals comic strip way back in the '60s. Uh, I, I I'm not. So this is this is where. Again, this is not my world. Yeah, uh, I don't. I don't know much about Maury Turner other than what I can Google. So, so the thing about this particular comic strip again, again, this one was before my time as well. But um, Maury actually brought uh, black characters to comic strips mm-hmm. strips during the sixties, yeah. which um, for that alone, they should be in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, they're. You're talking about a time when, when black people were just being allowed to drink at the same water f- faucet as a white yeah, person, eat at the so, same table. Yeah. So, um, well, I think know. it really, you know, from when I was reading about this, it was really after Dr. King's assassination that yeah. it really got national attention, right. And brought it up, and you know, again, it's one of those things. We live in a even today. We live in a very regional society, even though we have the internet and we're all kind of interconnected. There are things happening in the Southwest or the Northeast and things that we don't know about until something major happens right. and it just blows it up. Right. But that work is being done, and that's what I love about underground comics. Right. It's just you get that. Oh, for sure. So those four are definitely those four definitely are in. in. Um, the next people on this list are individuals that uh, will be getting voted on. Uh, I'm not actually sure what the qualification to become an Eisner voter is. You have to be in the industry in some capacity. So it's not just like they're not going to come ask right. me, hey, you know, you want to be an Eisner nominee? Unless you want to, I'll do it. Right. I mean, <laughs> um, but <laughs> so I'm not actually sure how they do that, but they have a, like a panel of people that, that vote on that. So the first one, and it's one that I, I truly, truly hope gets in, but I, I don't know when I look at the list of names, I don't know that they will. And that's Mr. Brian Boland. Um do yeah, th- I hope he gets in. I do. I, I really hope he gets in. But like I said, if you look at the list of names and people that we're going to read all through I mean, in a minute, there's some strong giants, contenders. But I mean, I mean, The Killing Joke is a seminal book. Yeah. Well, and not to mention what the work that he did with 2000 AD. Right. Uh, or Judge Dredd. He's the seminal yeah. Judge Dredd yeah. artist, too. So, um, you know, it, he's definitely got the credentials to be in any Hall of Fame for mm-hmm. Comic books and Animal Man, like his, his his stuff on Animal Man is just insane, and he's part of this whole group of just British uh, writers. Yeah, he was part of the artists. British wave that invaded comics in the eighties. Yeah, with uh, General Alan invaded is a horrible <laughs> word. But yeah, well, because they were already doing the work with uh, with yeah. with two thousand AD. They, they just came kinda, into American yeah. comics and. I don't know. If the Beatles were a British invasion of music, he can be the British invasion right on. of comics. <laughs> Certainly was part of it. Yeah. Right. All right. Next on the list is that's a big name too. Some guy I just I've never heard of this dude. At, you know, just yeah, like, yeah. yeah. I mean, Him and his partner, they just they were <laughs> crap. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Kevin Eastman. The, I mean, TNA, TM, TMNT. Yeah, like what I mean, more? What more do you say? Yeah, um, that's all you have to say. I mean, yeah. it impacted a generation. Absolutely. You know those guys when they started that book, they lived like down the street from each other. One of them would work on a, on a page, take the page to the other yep. one. The other one would work on it, and they yeah. would swap pages back and forth. So every page in those first issues of TMNT have both of their art on them, right? And yeah. just under they, they were they made them with a scanner, uh, well, like and a stapler. The name of their their publishing company was Mirage Press. Mm-hmm. And it was named that because it was literally a mirage. Yeah, it was, there, there was, was no there. company. There was at all. It, yeah, it was yeah. the two of them. They took their art and went down to the printing company yep. and said, "Make you know two thousand copies of this, and we're going to give them away at 
Uh, yeah, because they were it was they were in college. There were a couple of college nerds. I think one of them. I know you said they lived down the street. I think one of them. I, I don't think. I think it was Laird was like in a dorm room. Oh, and they possibly. were they were just doing this, and they got together and were like, let's make a parody of Daredevil. I think it was, yeah, and it absolutely. ended up being this, and it's yep. crazy. Splinter stick, and yeah, you know, there's yeah, the hand, the foot clan. Yep. And now, they actually have the ooze from it. From uh, the, I think the, the chemical company that, was the same. Blinded, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the same chemical yeah. company was on the canister. Yeah. Mm. yeah, it's absolutely a parody of Daredevil, but yeah, Almost, fantastic. Over four Ninja Turtles, and now it's just as big, if not bigger, as Daredevil. That's just again, you know, you look at what's being done at the the bottom level of underground comics. Uh, they're they're the people you'll know tomorrow for sure. Uh, the next is a person that I think absolutely is going to get inducted. I, I think this is a front runner for it, and that is Mr. Jose Luis Garcia Lopez, uh, Spanish artist, worked on Charlton. But if you if you know anything about DC, even though I'm not a DC guy, Drew like he is the seminal Superman artist yeah. to me. Right. Uh, just the, the thing about him that stood out to me when I was doing research for this is he started drawing comics professionally at the age of 13, mm-hmm. 13 years person. old. And he was making a living doing it. Oh, and comics. he's still working. Yeah. Uh, you know, you look at the, when they relaunched Superman last, last year, he did variant covers. He did some pinups. I mean, the guy still got it. Yep. He's, thought, what really speaks for his art is what I saw reading up about his nomination is that, and I didn't know this in the industry, but it makes complete sense that they have definitive style mm-hmm. drawings for every artist that comes onto a book. Yeah. And his art is what's the, is the DC official. This is how Superman looks. Yeah, it is. This That's, is how Wonder is. Woman looks. He makes those designs. That's fucking awesome. Yep. Uh, it's just the, the, we, we don't have the art that we have today without that man in DC. Yeah. Uh, just does so much. And when we talk about house style a lot, it, you kind of think of, Oh, well, house styles there's not that, that they're they're copying other style or anything this dude invented the house style right like he's the the everything else is his progeny at this point <laughs> so um next on the list is lynn johnson who is a canadian creator worked in uh comic strips more than anything yeah, yeah so yeah, she for did better or worse is a comic strip okay she did for better or for worse uh comic strip which i don't know how you, i read a lot of funny pages growing up as a kid it was how my parents got me to you know, it was one sit way in one to, spot. yeah, sit yeah. in one spot and here, sit down and read. And for better or for worse, was one of them that was uh, always uh, yep. there that you read every week in the Sunday funny pages. Good insight into family life mm-hmm. with a hum- you know a funny twist on it. So um, <laughs> she's very deserving of being in this group of people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Next on the list is Jeanette Kahn, and this one I'm excited about because it's the part of the industry that we don't think of a lot. This is the business side of things. Jeanette Kahn is an inspiration to everybody who wants to be on that side of the curtain. She was the publisher of DC Comics at 28. She's the reason DC Comics is called DC Comics. Mm -hmm. She rebranded it. Uh, She's 100% the reason that we know uh, what that is today. Uh, She... Was I mean she published Vertigo? She she's the people who put people like Alan Moore and Neil Gaiman on the national or the global scope. Right, right. You don't have that. I mean, there there are some other names. Actually, some other female names. Some other women who just worked their asses off to make that happen. That are just legendary. But she's the she's the impetus impetus of that. Um, and and she's absolutely integral to it. And she did it from the non creative side. Uh, yeah, and so I mean, that's really cool. When she came in, you had Fawcett, you had National. Uh, what is it? National periodical mm-hmm. publications. And you had all these different groups that were all under the DC umbrella, I guess you would say. And she combined it all into one and, and made it DC comics. Cause DC was actually an imprint of national publications I mm-hmm. believe, at that time. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, and at that time I think you still had action comics and wonder comics and all those. And I think she, she was one of the people who brought them under the same roof. Wasn't she? Well, no, they were, they were all, being written as DC Comics, but it was DC Comics okay. as a that was after the fact. Yeah, yeah it was 1977. She brought it all together and made it all DC Comics right. because like Shazam was still under Fawcett at the time and things of that nature. So, um, and like kind of what we were discussing earlier too with her creating the Vertigo line, mm-hmm. she she's kind of paved the way for even the big names to have the creator friendly policies, right? So to where, <laughs> um. 
Frank Miller could take Batman, do whatever the hell he wanted yeah. to do with it, with the Dark Knight Returns, mm-hmm. and to, and for everyone else to like, create like <laughs> Watchmen, probably would not have been made under the normal DC policies. So like she's responsible for all that. It definitely played a strong hand into it. Uh, so next is Paul Levitz. Uh, Paul Levitz is an editor, uh, edited Batman forever. Um, I think as a writer, he did Legions of Superheroes. Um, just uh, he, he's Paul Levitz. I don't know what else you <laughs> can say. Um, it's one of those names that we all know, but maybe we don't know what all he had his thumbprint on. Yeah, he you know he worked on the Comic Reader, which is was a news fanzine. Is that how you say that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, basically, a magazine created by fans for fans of the comic industry. Um, you know, just kind of been in the industry his whole life, either in it directly or related to it. So for sure. Um, Alex Nino is also nominated. Uh, he is, as an artist, he worked on house of mysteries, weird world, uh, weird war tales. Uh, he worked for everybody. Creepy eerie. He did Vampirella. He did heavy metal. Uh, he's even done some work for dark horse starting in the eighties. Uh, he started working on movies and video games. Uh, he's just somebody that if you if you've read any pulp magazines right. from the seventies, especially those creepy and you've seen stuff, he's work. all yeah. over those. Even if you don't know you've seen his work, you've seen his work. Oh, yeah, mm-hmm. I'm seeing the list. He's done this concept art for Hanna Barbera, the Sega video game company, and Walt Disney Pictures on Mulan and Atlantis. Right. Yeah. 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 He's definitely got the credentials. Uh, a, a long name, Lily Renee Wilhelm Peters Phillips. <laughs> and that is a mouthful. <laughs> Just a comic artist for, did a lot of horror stuff. Um, Werewolf Hunter, Senorita Rio, uh, did a bunch of pulp stuff, um, worked on some Abbott and Costello stuff. Uh, Known for her just stunning covers. Yeah, just she 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 the bombshell the bombshell pinups. Yep. Yeah, one hundred percent in that realm. Oh, absolutely. Uh, this one I'm really happy about because it's Wendy and Richard Peeney. They made ElfQuest. Like they right. uh, again, you're talking about people who who took underground comics or com. I mean, comics for girls at the time they that ElfQuest came out. Uh, you know, comics had become a boys' club, and then we're yeah. talking about in the post '60s and the mid '70s to the '80s. Um, prior to that, there was every genre of comics for everyone. There was adult. Right. There, I mean, there was porn. There was yeah. romance. There was westerns, and that kind of all died out for a while. But they took ElfQuest and. With, with a focus on young women readers really made that happen. And ElfQuest is insanely good. It's really, really well, great. Last I've heard really 40 years. About it. Mm-hmm. 40 years that book was out. Damn. Yes. Right. And uh, just ended in 2018. And, you know, they started their own uh, publishing company again, same as Eastman mm-hmm. and Laird, because no one wanted to publish their books. So they started their own. Uh, Mr. P. Craig Russell is nominated. Uh, just I, I, the list goes on and on for him. He's done stuff for Marvel. Uh, you know, he's a big Doctor Strange guy. Uh, did some stuff for the Magic Flute. Uh, I think my favorite uh, thing that he did was kind of an homage to the Jungle Book. That's incredibly good. He did novel. Uh, he did graphic novel ap- adaptations of the Sandman, uh, Coraline, American Gods. Uh, just on and on and on. Yeah, yeah, he actually, you know, he he was one of the artists on the Sandman book um, yeah. at the time, uh, and you know, currently, like you said, he's doing American Gods right now mm-hmm. for Neil Gaiman, so he's still he's still doing it. Yeah. So uh, this next name is somebody who, if they don't win, my jaw will hit the floor yeah, and crack. Yeah, everything. for sure. Uh, Bill Sinkevitz. He he worked on the seminal Electra Assassin book. He did the covers for New Mutants. Uh, he he is a covers guy. He's done he's done a lot of interiors too. But I think what really hits home is his really really I don't want to call it unique because at this point it's not unique. But he kind of I don't know that originated is the right word, but he definitely uh, it was groundbreaking at the time. Yeah, he oh, he for sure. took his style that not a lot of people had ever seen before and turned it into something that is is just still today it's it's multimedic uh multimodal it, it does so many things it works on so many levels yeah and what caleb's saying is is he took different styles combined them and made them a style he added painting to his line mm-hmm. work and things of this nature used really, photography yeah, and modge podge yeah. shit out of stuff things oh, things yeah. that yeah. hadn't really been done before in comics oh yeah his run on because uh, i'm my mind's going blank. I'll question myself. Uh, I believe he did the interior to the Demon Bear Saga, yeah. the old New Mutants. Mm-hmm. And I remember seeing it as a kid and not getting it. 
Like, this doesn't look like Rob LaField. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but, like, now you go back and, you know, my, my art palette has grown. And, yeah, it's just amazing cerebral work, especially for that horror story yeah. with a demon bear saga. That's uh, uh, one of the best ones. I think probably arguably the best story from that run. Yeah. Uh, Don and Maggie Thompson. Um, uh, Maggie Thompson's still alive. Unfortunately, her husband has passed on. Uh, they are kind of the two people who made fandom a thing. Yeah. Uh, they, you, you said fanzines a while ago. They're, they, they are one of the originators of fan magazines. Right. You wouldn't have gotten things like Wizard World or any of those fan centric or maybe even podcasts at this point. Right. Uh, but, you know, they're responsible for the Comics Buyers Guide. Uh, just this idea of bringing together people who enjoy this and creating, for better or worse, a collective. Um, it, it, a group of people who will get together and go to conventions and, and, right. and have these conversations. Right. So I'm glad to see them in there as well. Now, these last two are people from the manga side of things, and yes. Sean and Jerry are grinning from ear to ear over here. <laughs> um, the first one is Akira Toriyama. Um, oh, yeah. Made a little series called Dragon Ball Z. You may have heard of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, no surprise. Oh, well, not No surprise if you've heard of him, because at least Dragon, said Dragon Ball Z. But, I mean, this man's been making work since the early 80s. From uh, His first big one was Dr. Slump, which is a comedy gag manga. Then he decided he wanted to do an adventure story with Dragon Ball, which mm-hmm. later evolved into the fight fest that is Z that we all know of today. But, I mean, his work even before that, like, there's a real popular, more in Japan than here, called uh, RPG series called Dragon Quest. And he did the character and all the monster designs for every single iteration of that game Fair franchise. Nice. So. And he's influenced a lot of uh, other mangaka to come up and everything because, like, oh, I mean, he, there's there's he, several series that would not even be yeah. existing if he didn't, you know, do I mean, his thing. I mean, I'm pretty sure I could be wrong, but I'm pretty, he, if he didn't start it, he was definitely like what molded into what it is today mm-hmm. of what's called the shonen style of mm-hmm. battle manga. I mean, like, we wouldn't have One Piece, we wouldn't have My Hero Academia if it wasn't for him. Yep. Uh, and then last but certainly not least, or they wouldn't be on this list, Naoki Urasawa. Um, Japanese manga artist. Now, I've actually never read anything done by Naoki, but I do know the name, um, mostly because of 20th Century Boys. That's a that's a series that a lot of people, especially if you're fans of things like Akira, uh, then then you've at least heard of that. And it's good to see them on that list. Well, Yawara is certainly a huge name. I've not read it, but it's oh, a- I must say, unfortunately, I haven't read any of the work. But like Monster, I know it got a lot of mm-hmm. attention, and I got yelled at when I got requested to draw it. I mentioned I never read it, and I got yelled at for it. But uh, I mean, what, I've I've heard of all the anime and manga I've read and seen. This name, the this person's work always has stuck out. I recognize the names. So that's got to mean something. Yeah, right. So, and then we'll, we'll find out the answers to these at uh, San Diego Comic Con. That's when they always have the Eisner Awards. Right. Um, and you'll also find out who the you know what books they said were the best of the year, and right. they kind of do that in the middle. I want to say when is San Diego Comic Con? It's in the summer, correct? It's yeah, late summer or yeah. early fall. Yeah. So we'll find out uh, who wins. Um, I'm curious. I'm curious to know who they'll who they'll stick in because, like I said, those are some huge names. Yeah, yeah. I'm rooting for uh, Toriyama after, uh, getting in there for sure, especially after uh, Rumiko Takahashi we talked about last year uh, when she got in for all her work. So hoping he'll join her in that. Hey, speaking of nominations and big names, um, there's a little movie that we reviewed earlier in this this year that last year, last year, last year sorry, it is 2019. <laughs> it is already earlier this year. I know, right? Uh, <laughs> we're getting old. Fuck. Yeah, we are. Um, Black Panther got nominated for not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, not six, but seven, seven Oscar noms. That's insane. Uh, it broke all kinds of box office records. It is mainly being lauded for getting nominated for Best Picture of the Year, yeah. which is the first superhero. I, I'm putting that in quotes. Uh, first superhero movie to do so. I want to say Birdman. A few years ago, Birdman, which was a Michael Keaton movie, kind of paved the way for something like this to happen because it was a superhero esque film. Right. Uh, but it was not. It was on the nose. It was a. It was a metaphor. Right. Um, right. Black Panther is not a metaphor. This, Black Panther is a traditional superhero right. movie. And it, it got not now just just I'm curious, do you guys actually do you think it will win Best Picture? I do not. I don't yeah. think it's gonna pull in Best Picture, but I think it's gonna get it's gonna win a few of the other awards that it's nominated for. Oh definitely. So some of the other awards it's gonna get um I think it's nominated for that it will win. It's 
best sound editing, best costume design. I think it's definitely costume, getting the best for costume. Sure, I think it's going to win best original song. Uh, yeah, I think they've been wanting to give Kendrick Lamar a Oscar for yeah. a minute. Well, I think this too. is a good chance to. And the original score as a whole, it, it's nominated right. for that sound mixing, product design. It, it's going to rack up. I think out of seven, I would not be surprised to see it win four, a solid four, right. maybe five. Yeah. Um, I just I really don't think when I look at the list of some of the other films that came out this year that it it can contend as far as best picture well, with right. some of the other ones. So it was a great movie for what it did uh, for both the super, superhero genre and culturally for right. people of color. For sure. However, it's not the best picture that came out this year. Yeah, I, I, I'm I don't glad it, it was nominated, but it's not the best movie that came yeah. out last year. Well, that is that watershed moment. Like now, a superhero film has been nominated, right. so now we can start kind of to paving the way. Yeah, we're yeah. you're right. you're moving it out of just like this idea that it's just for kids or that it's popcorn films that it can do. It can do important cultural work, which is what a lot of the films are usually nominated do. Absolutely, uh, and and I I think in the next five years we'll see a full blown. Marvel, DC, uh, comic book based inspired film actually win. I think it's setting the pay. I think Joker is what they're trying to do. Yeah. I think DC wants Joker to be a movie that's taken seriously for awards. Yeah. I mean, putting Joaquin Phoenix in the lead role alone, that is definitely showing that they're, <clears throat> I think they're trying to take it a lot more serious. And what they're saying about production and the story is going to be. Uh, it's like not going to be a normal Joker telling. I think we're going to look at a, a tragedy into his life. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So it was interesting. I was reading an article, and I forget where, it, uh, which which Entertainment Weekly or whatever it came out of. Apparently, they rewrote the script yeah. while they were shooting. To oh, it. wow. Mm. So that like that makes me worried because everything I've been seeing up until now, I was like, okay, Joaquin Phoenix Joker movie, insane people. Like, okay, it looks really good. Yeah, I don't know. That made me like take a step back when they're like, oh no, we came up and we rewrote. A major part of the script that uh, happens in the middle a of lot shooting. more than people realize. That's though. true. I think yeah. So. It, 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 yeah, there's a lot of rewrites as the movie's going on. Things don't play out on camera quite as well as they thought they would. And to change something, sometimes they have to rewrite part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, it doesn't worry me too much. I think that's just part of the process in Hollywood anymore. I hope so because yeah. uh, I have high hopes for this. Um, almost, you know, not as high hope as I did for Black Panther, but. Yeah. It's up there. I just, yeah. I really I really hope Black Panther racks up, man. Yeah, for sure. Uh, just it, deserve, for, it deserves a win. Yeah, several of those categories. Well, and I, you know, one thing that might help it, uh, and I say help, I'm again put that in quotation marks. Um, a lot of people are calling for Bohemian Rhapsody to get taken off the list because of the Brian Singer uh, situation, um, which aggravates. I understand it, but it also aggravates me. A ton of people worked on that movie, mm-hmm. not just right. Brian Singer, uh, and a ton of people put hey, their heart and soul into that. Roman even, Polanski yeah. won for exactly. The Pianist, yeah. and, and he can't even come to America. No. And Singer didn't even finish the movie, right? No. And he get, Singer, he took over, so he wasn't Oh, no, he finished. took over. Yeah. reversed. Okay. Um, but, for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, Brian Singer has a long reputation of being... Um, a child molester. Yeah. Uh, for, for Noah, I mean, that's just what it is. Like, he, yeah. he likes to fuck underage guys. Uh, that, and it's like, we, we've heard this for years. I mean, I live in Arkansas and I knew this three years ago, so it's yeah. not like it's a very well kept right. secret. I'm not exactly connected. <laughs> um, it's just kind of a thing that people know. He shouldn't have been allowed to work on this shit anyway. And then they're going to turn around and give him the red fucking Sonya movie, which pisses me off to no end because rape is a huge part of her backstory. And I'm sorry, it, if you're going to have a conversation about rape, if you're going to make a film about rape, you don't hire a fucking racist or rapist to or tell that story. <laughs> uh, so he shouldn't, you know, he shouldn't be anywhere near the Red Sony movie, and they're going to go ahead with it. It just it's a ag- aggravates Brands. me. It does kill Brian. Uh, just uh, why? Why do you keep giving these motherfuckers chances? I don't know. It's I don't know why Brian Singer keeps getting work other than most of the time we find his movies entertaining, it, and it's un. It, no, he shouldn't get work. Yeah. But that's why. Because people go to see his movies. True. That's why. I mean, but I mean what it if, comes down to money. What has he done in the past 10 years? I mean, X, X1 and 2, okay, I'll give you that. What has he done in the past 5 years, 10 I don't years? Know. I'd have to go look, That would so. get, that would, I, I just I, don't understand. I, I, I agree. He shouldn't be working. But, you know, that it's Hollywood guy. and people that make money are going oh, yeah. to get the opportunity. All right, so we've got a few things left on the list. I'm going to throw it out to you guys because we are going we're running out of time in our, our new restructured time slots. So we can talk about the new wave of Ahoy Comics, which came out, which um, I'm excited about. We can talk about 
the CW finally giving us a televised trans superhero, which also is a watershed moment uh, because they're actually using a trans actress to play that character. That's fucking rad. We can talk about film trailers. I say we talk about the CW and the film trailers. Okay. I think we can get all three of those in. All right. So the CW is giving us a trans superhero in, uh, I think it's going to be in Supergirl. Uh, And this, this I'm excited about because... They're actually using a trans actress to play. And I had to, like, when I saw this, I I kind of rolled my eyes a little bit. I'm like, okay, what woman they get to play the trans character? No, they're using a trans a trans actress. N- Nicole Maines, uh, it, she, she's a trans woman. Um, I went and, you know, looked her up, saw what all she was doing. She's she's a woman. And she's playing this role, and I think that's great. And God bless Super. I'm an atheist. I'm even going to say God bless, bless Supergirl. <laughs> it has done so much representation. Yeah. So, and it's good. Like, it's not like, it's all these assholes out there who are, you know, uh, diversity hires and this, that, and that. No, Supergirl's good. It's one of the few shows I actually go back and watch. Did they ever teach her how to punch? Yes. It, okay. It's gotten, it's, yeah. The, the fight choreography has gotten better. Okay. That was my biggest problem. It had nothing to do with anything else. It was, I couldn't watch, <laughs> stand watching her fight because she never knew how to punch. No, that's, 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 it, whenever you have the strength of Kryptonian, you don't really have to know. Also, I want to know how she got a scar on her face. <laughs> She's Kryptonian. That's a good question. Yeah, right. Maybe, maybe it happened. Well, on, right? Crypt- no. on Krypton, she doesn't like. She wouldn't have any special powers. She was sent off as a baby. Um, so maybe, maybe, maybe it happened before. Baby. You think maybe your mom dropped her? Maybe. Out of, super, maybe that's what. Her out of Superman shave. I mean, there's all kind of questions with <laughs> Kryptonian. They've answered that. He uses a mirror and laser beams. laser beams into the mirror back in his beard. Bullshit. <laughs> I don't buy it. <laughs> he, he what he shoot, does? He can shoot through a mirror with them lasers. I'm sorry. Yeah, what, ooh, that's a good point. Wouldn't it blow up the mirror? Wouldn't it melt the mirror? No. I mean, he can he can set the degree of temperature on his. Maybe he's the guy dial in the back of his head. Yeah. <laughs> Broil. Oh, but yeah, this yeah. is this, <laughs> this is this is huge. Uh, yeah. No. Yeah. And the sure. the costume looks great. Uh, it, every, everything about this is fun. Um, I'm sure certain people would rip up the comic if they had it. Well, and <laughs> they're just having their TVs. <laughs> well, avoid comment sections. That's all yeah. I can say to this because. Yeah. Sight unseen, people are all they need to see is the word trans, and they're you know, I can't believe you're force feeding this to our children. Uh, your, your kids have seen trans people before, you've seen trans people before. Um, you didn't know it because it's not actually a big goddamn deal, right? Uh, and again, just for, for actors, and I know this is a conversation we've had on the show before. Um, I, I'm glad we're seeing trans actors playing trans characters. Uh, we, we've long since gotten past the point that, well, you need this big name actor to play this, the this cisgendered or like whatever you want to call it actor to play this role just so you can get the message out there we've gotten past that point we've had those we've had those stories uh boys don't cry was 30 years ago uh you, you can tell you can hire trans people you can hire gay people to play gay actors we're we're out there you don't have to cgi cgis in uh you know there's been more movies with dinosaurs than there have been with trans actors so that's a problem and i'm glad to see us getting past that see we're making yeah. we're moving as the government decides to fire everybody that's trans um <laughs> Fucking assholes. You need to go on another rant. Go for nope, it. nope. I'm, I'm <laughs> taking deep breaths and moving on because we're going to talk about some trailers that oh, came yeah. out just last. Um, uh, Jerry, I'm going to let you go on this one because you were super pumped. John Wick 3 came out and like I, like immediately you were just like messaging us like, oh my God. Was that me or was that Sean? It was me. It wasn't you? Yeah. I mixed you two up. Yeah. It's, it's not, it it's, have it's giant not robots difficult to do. <laughs> well, we not are on the phone. practically the same person. Yeah. It didn't have giant robots in it, so Jerry wasn't really flipping out. Okay. No, John Wick 3. I am super hype. I was, cause I, I, I shared the trailer on our mm-hmm. Facebook page and talking about how if this third one is as good as the first two, it may be my favorite action trilogy of all time. Because if you haven't seen John Wick, it's just Keanu Reeves is a retired badass who has to go back to being a badass. That's the, that's the short version of what these movies are about. And three, it looks like they want to wrap it up with a bang. Uh, if you haven't seen part two, this one is tied directly into the events of part two, where basically everyone now is hunting John Wick instead of him being the hunter. So we got a citywide, at least a city, if not coming, I'm sure they're coming from out of town too, all to hunt down John Wick, who is just an amazing badass. And Keanu Reeves has just dived headfirst in his role in these films with his training for gunplay and his martial arts. So... This one looks insane, and I, but know what though? I, I gotta address it. I don't. I don't know why people are getting mad. That people have to pick out one thing and to be mad about something. They're offended by the horse. <laughs> he's riding the horse. I'm like, yeah, and he's killing fuckers on motorcycles on it. What's the <laughs> fucking problem? Like, I don't know, man. I saw him on the horse. I just don't know. People don't uh, like. I people watch who ride trailer. horses. 
I don't, I don't know. know. That's like that's the only thing that I've heard people say negative. I tell them to shut the fuck up immediately because <laughs> it's like, yeah, but I saw him on the horse and I just wasn't really like. Wait till you watch the movie, people. Like, really? Wait, what? I just... Like, how hard is it? Like, a they're like they. I don't know if they think it's unbelievable. There's plenty of horse bound cops that take that. They, uh, they horse. do know horses exist in real life. I right? don't think so. I think their only thing is in Red Dead too. Oh. Were they? they, they were they trans in horses? <laughs> <laughs> they were not played by trans. Horses. Well, <laughs> the only thing I can think of, I know in larger cities, like I think last year there was a big deal made. Um, the mayor of New York said that they were phasing out the horse drawn carriages. Right. Um, number one, they they I, they claim something about it being because of. Uh, horse rights or something like that. But I, I, at the end of the day, it was about the fact that the horse shit gets on everything right. yeah. and they're I expensive. Like, uh, yeah, the they, between, they still have like horse the uh, cops. cops. That's yeah. Right. And cops that's where I'm horses. assuming he probably yeah, got it from. That's what yeah. I was thinking. And I'm like, I just don't know why. I, just, I don't know. It's like the only negative thing I've, I've heard about people seeing a story like, yeah, but I'm on that horse and I'm just not, not sure anymore. Like, like I want to see a horse cop wearing like a, a CHP hat. <laughs> the little helmet that that they wore back in chips. But yeah, the trailer looks amazing though. Uh, Halle Berry is joining him in this yeah. movie as well, and she's got two dogs, and she looks like she's gonna be a badass as well. So, so what I saw, I haven't watched one or two yet. I, I know they're amazing. I know. So um, but watching the trailer, it was visually stunning. Mm-hmm. Oh, they are. They are. I mean, it was just absolutely visual. I mean, like take your breath away from what I saw of it. So I, I mean, it made me want to go watch the it, first it's, two. It's yeah. basically, it's basically like almost the Taken like amount of action and stuff like that, but without losing its premise. Right. Gotcha. With with, yeah. with good acting. Yeah. 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 <laughs> absolutely. Right. One last little thing I'll throw in about it. Like my dad watched the first one on my recommendation, and after watching it, he you knows I'm a big martial arts guy. He's like. What martial arts style was he using in that movie? So I don't know. Like throw a guy, shoot a guy. That's, that's, that's <laughs> what he does. Like he will flip him over Probably a table and a headshot. Krav Maga combination. I, I, it, but it's just like his, his technique of eliminating people is usually to break something, then shoot them dead in the, dead right. in the face. Most just, most martial arts movies yeah. use Krav Maga, Maga especially yeah. especially if you want to go. You can tell he went through like kind of military style training yeah. for this role because like everything is just on point. Do you at some point go Google gun kata? Gun cut. Oh, that's, I know gun. Yeah, that's 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 <laughs> we, what that's a, we, it's a we mix watch, of. We yeah. watch Equilibrium. I've right. seen Equilibrium. Yeah, that's, that's what I <laughs> oh, called I it. Gun Fu. When yeah. I watched I just, Equilibrium, I was thinking more fun to throw a guy, shoot a guy. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's all. It's basically that. Um, yeah, so sure. you know what the the only thing I can think of that's cooler than Keanu Reeves shotgunning folks in the face from a horse? Yeah, Sam Elliott's mustache. Oh, it's yeah. the only thing. Now this, I'm excited. This about. maybe this was what I was thinking yeah. of. Um, <laughs> the man who killed Hitler and then Big Fish. Right. What yes. is the last movie you remember seeing Sam Elliott in? He's been in a few. He's played like part roles. Yeah, in the past yeah. yeah. Nothing been, major. He yeah. was on the ranch. Uh, yeah, on Netflix. Um, a Star is Born. Was um, I saw him in. He was in that. I haven't seen that yet, but he was on that. Yeah. So, so in this movie, he's you know starring a character that was in World War II. Turns out he killed Hitler. Mm-hmm. And I guess some FBI, you know, secret ops people found out about that. And they have a very particular issue that they need dealt with. <laughs> um, and it just so happens that it's Bigfoot. And Bigfoot has a plague that could destroy humanity. And they need Sam Elliott to take Bigfoot down. It's the only thing I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. Like, it, this came out the same day as John Wick 3. I watched John Wick 3. I'm like, oh, yeah, this is the best thing I'm going to watch this year. And then I saw the, I saw this, this Sam Elliott Hitler Bigfoot trailer. I'm like, nope, that so, that's definitely the So best when one. I saw this, the name was like, eh. <laughs> and then I watched the trailer, and it made me think, you know, Schlotsky, that serious, you know, funny yeah. name, serious sandwich? Yeah. That's how I felt about this when right. I watched the trailer. Right. It's like, the tra- the name of the movie is not doing it right, justice right. for what how good it looks like it's going to be. But it's so perfect. It's such a perfect name. But it's, it's on the nose. <laughs> it's very much I'm on the nose. I'm also assuming that it's going to be either take place 20 years ago. Yeah. Or it's going to be that he hunted down Hitler after he escaped. Mm-hmm. That they're going to tie in that whole conspiracy Possibly. that Hitler escaped because Sam Elliott's too young to play a World War II vet. Right. Well, My it, grandpa it, it, just yeah. died at 90 years old and he was 17 when the right. war started. Right. So You said Sam Elliott and young. I'm like, no, I got to do math. But yeah, no, you're I'm right. Pretty sure, no, I'm pretty sure he was born an old man <laughs> <laughs> with that voice and mustache. He was born with the mustache. <laughs> at no some doubt. point, we're going to find out that, that Yetis and Bigfoots are actually just what happens whenever he shaves. For some, <laughs> for some real, so apparently, um, I know this because I have some friends in the film industry that were making a movie and they had toyed with the idea a few years ago of getting him. 
he charges an extra fifteen grand if he has his mustache. Yeah, like you can get him. You can get Sam because apparently he doesn't actually <laughs> like it because it itches. So he shaves the majority of time. But if you want him to have this amazing Sam Elliott mustache, you throw fifteen grand on top of it and you get that. Mm-hmm. So what I'm assuming is happening is after every time that he does that and he gets rid of it, that's how Yetis are born. <laughs> that's how Yetis, like, well, they started when he was younger. They were Bigfoot because they're brown yeah. and big and lumbering, right? And as he's gotten older, salt and pepper age takes over. That's where the Yetis come in. I'm am just assuming that's that's the I only thought, I thought Yetis and Bigfoots were failed attempt at um, uh, creating a Chuck Norris clone. Nope. No. Sam Elliott mustaches. <laughs> Sam Elliott mustaches with legs. <laughs> yeah, this this movie looks really good though. I I mean, yeah. it w- looked to me to be much more serious than the title yeah, gives for it credit sure. for. Like, I think it's going to actually be a pretty epic journey kind of story. This is not also the hunt. Yeah, yeah, for sure. This is an Abraham Lincoln vampire hunter. <laughs> Which was amazing. Yeah. yeah, but that's not what this is. <laughs> right, absolutely. So before we get on from news, um, there was another kind of, it was big news, but it was also not big news at the same time. Uh, DC is doing some restructuring. Yeah. And so they, they laid some people off. Uh, a lot of people were kind of wondering if Dan DiDio was losing his job, editorial, this, that, and the other. And it turned out not to be that. Uh, one yeah. major editor, I think, was laid off. They they laid off seven people, which is three percent of their workforce. But it was in the 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 structural side of things that we really don't know about. What that tells me is that we're going to see other changes on down the line. That it, it is eventually going to affect editorial. They're supposed to be getting back to the basics, which I think arguably they got rid of the one guy who still remembers what DC was thirty years ago. Um, so I'm not sure how that's going to work out. I'm just interested to see what happens. Well, Jeff Johns is going to be in all the roles at yeah. DC. He's just yeah. going to be DC? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's the plan. How do you spell Jeff Johns? DC? DC. Yep, that's it. <laughs> I was well, like, is this a trick question? I know how to spell Jeff Johns. <laughs> <laughs> two letters. It's DC. Yeah. Uh, all right. So that's kind of a roundup of what happens with news. Um, so, again, we're going to be doing this once a month, kind of towards the end of the month each time. If you guys really, really dig the way that we're doing the structuring in the segments, let us know. If you don't, let us know. Uh, we, you know, we kind of work off feedback. It's really the only way we know how how you guys are, are liking what we're doing. You gotta you gotta reach out and connect it to us, and you can do that on our Facebook group. Uh, we're Southern Fried Geekery on Facebook. It's, uh, the group has been popping. I love this new group. We yep. got away from the page, actually getting some interaction. People are posting what they're liking. It's great. We're still uh, kicking ass on Instagram and Twitter. You're at SFG. Uh, podcast on both of those so come hang out with us come come talk to us or shoot us an email southern fried geekery at gmail.com all right so are you guys ready for this oh yeah you already jerry you got your you got your ready pants on uh i'm wearing pants does that count yes okay okay yeah. tell us about some anime guys uh so the series that we got today uh it actually came out uh what was that 2017 yeah. uh had a 13 episode run uh it's called knights and magic A.K.A. if Jerry went to another realm. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Jerry, we're talking about another SEK series. God right. help us. Oh, you know, I, I started thinking about it. I'm like, holy shit. We've talked about a lot of those. I mean, like, like, we I mean, mentioned yeah. it, though. That this genre has really blown up. Yeah. Is it nights? Like, what happens like K-N-I. when the sun goes? Okay. I was. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's what I was. <laughs> I'm sitting there trying he's to. never pronounce it like that. <laughs> Monty Python reference. I'm with you. He, he <laughs> got you. I got he you, got boo. It. That's right. I got yeah. you, boo. He got it. Um, so the, the way that this series starts out is you have this, um, uh, man, I think he's probably in his twenties or so. He he works as a programmer. He's like a fucking genius programmer. Right. Um, but he also has a secret life and he is a a mecha otaku. So like... In the first like five minutes, I already knew I was connected to this character <laughs> on a personal because deep level. because he was like being secretly and like not going out with his coworkers after work, and I'm like, yeah. well, what's he doing? And he's in the fucking giant convenience store with all the models carrying them and like <laughs> getting special editions and stuff. And as yeah. he's walking across the street, he gets hit by a car and dies. Um, was this the creation of wasn't this the creation of the <laughs> meme uh, truck coon <laughs> <laughs> probably the truck that just hunts down people to send them <laughs> no that was or, uh, that was Jojo part 4 it was Jojo yeah. okay, okay. <laughs> actually they brought him back for this show <laughs> so he uh, he essentially wakes up and he is in the body of a child with all of his memories and he's on a carriage and you're just like where can it go from here and you know thinking about um, it took me a while to get into this just be, based off of the name because it didn't seem like anything I was into. And he's like in there with what appears to be maybe his grandfather and his mom and their carriage gets attacked by this monster. And 
you know, what what is to possibly save them from this, but a giant fucking robot. And it comes and fends off the, the monster and everything, and he's just in awe, mouth agape, starry-eyed, uh, looking at this thing. And it turns out that this world that he got whisked into, um, they have these uh, mechs called Silhouette Knights. Yeah. And I we don't know if he took over this, his consciousness took over this child's body or what happened, but he's basically in this royal family and they were on their way to take him to the school to become one of these silhouette knights. And basically how it works is it's like a Harry Potter-esque thing where you have to learn about magic and everything first and then you work your way up the ranks and then become a pilot of one of these things. The thing about it is, is he's so smart and the things in this world he just learns just so easily right. and it turns out that magic in this world is a lot like um doing the uh programming, programming. yeah so he'll get to like you know your you have your basic magic circle they're you know trying to t- teach him the basics and stuff well he finds out that he can basically with his coding knowledge add on more complex things to that <laughs> and make a ridiculously crazy spell and then he, you know, he's he's basically changing the entire structure of their lives. He's like, you know, why do we have to use it uh, like these wands? And they're like, well, this is how it's always been. You know, we've always used these. He's like, well, I kind of have this idea. So he finds these these dwarves that are in charge of making weapons and stuff. And he comes up with all these designs. And he he pretty much makes like a rifle like wand <laughs> that he then, you know, <laughs> uses. Wand. Yeah. He's so mad. then it, it, it ends up becoming the standard for the school and all he's pissing off all of his teachers because they're like, <laughs> this isn't the way, you know, you're not supposed to do it like this. We're traditionalists and stuff like that. And he ends up just kind of like showing up and he makes these, these two friends and they kind of start like, you know, you're really weird, but this stuff is really cool, and you know we want to we want to hang out with you. So they start getting all of it too, which is also how we became friends with Jerry. <laughs> yeah. You're really weird, but you yeah. got cool stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so he, um, you know, other than, than learning all these uh, these basics of magic and enhancing them and everything, and pissing off all of, all of his teachers, he keeps trying to get to these. Uh, these giant robots so he yeah. can finally pilot one but they're like no you have to go through this, yeah, this no, but all he wants is to get in a giant fucking robot because he is a Gundam fanatic basically I don't, yeah. I don't think they ever actually used Gundam but that's no. what it was yeah like and, and it's like even whenever he's in the department store <laughs> yeah. I can pick out like the right. pictures on all the boxes of like oh that's what that is I have a question about that yeah. so is Gundam it, like is that trademarked is that why like is, Gun, like, is Gundam very I mean Gundam is, is a franchise okay it is, yeah. is a franchise that started in the 70s which we'll get into Gundam one of these days yeah. for sure but yeah it is that is actual brand and okay. probably the brand for giant robots in japan right i just didn't know like if a random person like if i wanted to make a, a gun a, a robot movie or manga or whatever and draw the person sitting in if i could call it like caleb's gundam adventures or <laughs> no. if i'm gonna get sued and that's <laughs> you, you, you get sued okay that's yeah that's yeah. that's why then that makes sense yep. they uh so they they have this whole um study where they're going out in the field checking on things and they have this giant turtle monster that ends up popping up and this thing is like you know a catastrophe level monster and the only thing that their knights could really do is try to you know try to slow it down a little so people could get safe and try to ward it away from the city they don't know why it's headed that way and he kind of gets curious and he sees one of the people like running away like they get scared at the side of this thing because it just annihilates a bunch of their their people so he flies up and finds this guy like basically pissing his pants in the cockpit of this he's like hey just scoot over a little bit so he <laughs> he hacks this robot with this rifle gun that he made because they're all controlled by magic he is just ridiculous at it like everything you know all the rest of them are just moving like kind of standard robot they don't right. they don't have the concept of right. like fast moving robots because right. yeah, even though they're giant robots just think of it still as like the, the same lumbering knights of mm-hmm. actual medieval england like you know that it's it's giant robot but it's still just basically a giant suit of armor yeah at this point there's no flexibility yeah. everything's kind of static mm-hmm. until our hero arrives. Yeah. right and, and and all their weapons are essentially like oh you have a sword and if you want to do any range combats, you got to pull out your wand and use that. Um, so he pretty much pushes these things to its limits, ends up destroying the, the giant turtle, and the entire mech just gets destroyed because it couldn't handle the stuff that he did to it. So then he ends up 
getting an audience with the king because of this thing that he did. And they start putting him on kind of like a trial basis and let him develop things. They give him like so many months to, to try these different things. And they have like these, these fibers, these magical fibers that help it move. And what he basically decides to do with those is instead of having them, you know, just straightened in, he turns them into like, muscle ligature and starts winding them together and he's like well they'll work better if we just kind of combine them and and they'll stretch better and be able to do that and he just he takes that idea and then he's like well instead of having to switch back and forth from like your wand to your sword uh we can add extra arms on the back and put wands on them so you can just switch and he had like new types of control mechanisms yeah. and he's just like blowing their minds because they've done this for like yeah. 500 he, years he basically so. created the shoulder mounted turret yeah. <laughs> with that yeah like it's a, and that's what i like like the jerry obviously is definitely the big robots guy amongst his group and I, i've built some model kits and i've watched plenty of that but this one i liked it a lot more than normal mecha yeah because it's a is taking that i like the evolution from the mid mm-hmm. I said, granted, giant robot, but still the medieval setting. And he's like, no, 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 we're bringing this into the into the space age with creating lasers and all the unique mechs they designed mm. from, uh, like I said, the multi arm ones to the horse style yeah. uh, mech, maybe and, like centaur ones. Yeah, so like it's an it was a really fun series, especially like as we mentioned before, the Isake genre is just loaded up. There's so many of them. This one I think really stood out and. Be, because it's kind of a, u- a unique reasoning for the hero to know what he knows. It came from being a fucking model nerd and programmer and stuff. Yeah. And so I watched three quarters of the first episode, mm-hmm. somewhere around that. Maybe that might be generous. It. Um, <laughs> and, it, and it's not because it was bad. It's just not my thing. Yeah. It was, yeah. I watched it. I understood immediately why Jerry would love it. Mm-hmm. Um, my question is, is what happened to the kid? consciousness that he took over i mean that poor kid he's just dead now? see i mean it's it's just uh they no never one talks really ex- about that kid this Not stuff. Wrong. <laughs> so it's it's either like the his conscience his consciousness created this world and started him off in this body or there was previously a kid's consciousness in this body and he took it over <laughs> i i haven't read the light novels or the uh the manga series that takes place after it to really know right um but it's just kind of interesting because you know it starts off with them fighting these monsters and them kind of advancing their tech from that and then they find out about these other countries that are trying to attack so then they have to advance even further and um one of the there's there's kind of a stigma with this type of animation especially in like um with robot uh series and that's cg animation Mm -hmm. and what they do is they'll have you know your standard animation with all the characters the backgrounds and stuff like that and then for things like ships and and giant robots and stuff of that nature They'll do it CG. Um, I with with CG animation, you know, constantly improving. Whenever I first saw stuff like that, I wasn't a huge fan of it. Um, and then, you know, it, it kind of with the advancement of it, it kind of grows on you after a while. And I think for this series, it actually does really well. It didn't I, yeah, stand out to it. me at all. Um, yeah. And that's why I give this show especially the credit on because. Mm-hmm. You'll see, and even on modern shows like the the, the Grappler Baki anime that mm-hmm. recently came out on Netflix, uh, for certain fight scenes, it just throws back. They switch to that instead of the beautiful hand drawn art, mm-hmm. and it's very just. It's such a contrast of style as Blade, and to me, it made me enjoy the show less. Mm-hmm. Knights and Magic, they they went with what's called at least back then it used to be called cell shading in video games, right. where it was. 3D polygons, but it almost looked like a 2D flat drawing. And mm-hmm. I think they went more with that style for the mechs in the mm-hmm. show, so it blended a lot better than mm-hmm. a lot of some other ones that are, like I said, very look completely different, and it takes you out of it. Right. right. So, yeah, I, th- I think it worked very well in the show. It helped me enjoy it. Mm-hmm. And and I know uh, Russ and I had kind of talked about it before because they made a newer Berserk series, and they went yeah. full on with that right. type of animation. And we had to kind of give it a chance to let it actually grow on us. So Yeah, that one, it got better as the season went on, but it was still just very uh, stiff animation, right. which which bugs me. But stiff animation works with robots mm-hmm. a little bit better. At least you're a little more forgiving yeah. when it's a giant hulking machine over, it's supposed mm-hmm. to be a human fluid. <clears throat> right. So, yeah. 
I now, enjoyed Knights of Magic, and like I said, I'm not as big of a robot guy as you, but yeah, I thought it was a very enjoyable. Were there any trans horses in it? <laughs> <laughs> if you if you like if you like Mecha, um, you uh, just you're me. a fan of the uh, it was a Mecha the trans giant horse. the giant robot um, genre and everything. Uh, if you're a fan of building uh, robot models, I definitely recommend the series. In awesome. general, just the way you talked about it, the thing that got me, I, I love. I love things with magic. Like I'm a fan of Harry Potter and all that mm-hmm. stuff. But one thing I always complain about is they never really show um, the the aspects of like a militarized society getting their hands on magic. And it sounds right. like they're actually tapping into that. Like my favorite part of Harry Potter is when they actually fucking fight. Right. Not that we do this. Hey, we're going to have a duel and stand on each side. Like no, when they're going full bore, bodies are dropping, magic's flying yeah. everywhere. Goddamn dragons are popping up. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it, like you said, he built an AK-40 assault <laughs> wand. Right. Like, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. And that's that's something I think that would actually happen. So I really like to, uh, I like that concept. Yeah. Now, how did you guys, how did you guys watch this? Crunchy uh, Crunchyroll. Crunchyroll? Yeah, yeah. Crunchyroll. We just have a tradition of watching the first episode of every new show yeah. and see what it's about. Yeah, I, I think actually I was just kind of like, I don't know, just surfing around looking for something new to watch, and the cover of it had a giant robot, and I was like, "No, I'll, I'll give this a shot." No, I'll give it a shot. And then, and then after I think like the second or third episode, I was like, "Sean, check us out." Yeah. Nice. Well, I don't have the Crunchyroll app. I know you guys do. Um, I use VRV. If you do have you? VRV, um, I, I don't. But. Okay, so VRV combines Crunchyroll and Shutter and like a ton of t- a bunch VRV of, is amazing. Yeah, so nice. I use VRV instead of Crunchyroll now because I mean they give Crunchyroll their share. It's about whatever, the same but, price and you get the exact same. Right. You get all yeah. of Crunchyroll plus a, a bunch of amazing other. That uh, Boomerang was added to yeah. it. I mean yeah. they've added a bunch of different stuff to it. So that's what I use for my. Well, for those of you who are like me and don't have Crunchyroll or VRV, you can actually get the entire complete collection of Knights of Magic on Amazon. It's available on Prime. Uh, right now, they've got it priced at thirty eight seventy six. Yes. So if you don't have those other apps and you want to watch it, you can do like me and just buy it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you can go home and watch it because... Did he just say he's buying it? No, I bought <laughs> it. It's, I've already done it. Oh, he bought it? Yeah, I'm going to watch it later. Oh, I haven't watched it yet, yeah, but I do own it. Oh, um, look at you. Enough. Yeah, because I when when you guys were talking about this, I wanted it. <laughs> you guys sold they, Caleb. They need to make, sold they need to make literally them. sold. Them they need to make time. models. Oh, I've been begging for that. That's, like I said, I've, I've yeah. slacked off on buying model kits because I'm running out of room for mm-hmm. stuff that I'm not like collecting things. But like, mm-hmm. if they put out model kits for this series, I I get them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I think there's some. I, I, when I was looking it up on Amazon, there was some model kits. I don't know if they were directly from this series, but I do. I, I uh, searched oh, Knights and Magic. There, yeah. there, um, so the 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 things that they have are just uh, they're action figures essentially. Um, they uh, I really wish that they would just straight up make like yeah. kits that you can build and a everything. Because yeah. uh, I know him and I were interested in it. And Crunchyroll will usually have a sell on those and and everything. But yeah. So you know what else I bought recently that I think both of you are going to be proud of me for buying? Oh boy. What? Ready? The Shonen Jump app. Aww. Sign Dang. up for it. Yeah. Yep. Um, how, how many series have you read? So I haven't read any yet because <laughs> um, I just, I think I signed up for it uh, yesterday mm-hmm. or day before yesterday. So you're ready um, for recommendations. But school has been, school kicked back in. So I haven't yeah. read it, but I am signed up for it. I am going to take advantage of it. Mm-hmm. Um, not only because you guys were talking about it. Our buddies over at the 11 o'clock comics podcast, uh, like there were a, c- a couple of us that decided to jump on it at the same time. And it was just like, finally, like, okay, I signed up for it. Let's too. do. Yeah. So we all get to, we're going to have some manga that we're going to throw into the regular rotation here pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm curious because I know we all have different tastes in comics. And so I'm just, I can't wait to see what the different manga, and this is why I, I almost don't want recommendations. Like I want to dive in and to see what I can find on my own. No. So okay, like but saying that, Sean and I, and Sean even more more uh-huh. so, have been getting into the series called Promise Neverland. Mm-hmm. Oh I, I'm yes. almost I'm almost ten chapters in now. I'm um, over yeah. seventy. Yeah, <laughs> you're Sean over just, seventy. Yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> no, no, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty badass. So you're almost out of the the what is it the the prologue? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> the no, like this. Like we got time. Not trying to kill it too much time. Of it. No, go ahead. No, Promise Neverland. You'll, it is a setup that I think will draw everyone in and I'll give the first episode gives away basically the big reveal is in the first after episode or first chapter, mm-hmm. like, however you want to do it. It's about kids in an orphanage raised secluded, but taken care of loved by their mother. Long story short, one of them gets adopted and they go uh, to give her back her plush doll that she left before getting taken to meet her foster parents. Find out she's dead and food for demons. They are in a cattle farm. Yeah. 
for a world run by demons mm-hmm. that oh. want to eat human flesh. And, and it seems like every time one of them gets adopted, they get a new one in. Yeah. It's always yeah. replaced. It's always by replenished. Baby. Yeah. And like, yeah. W- like Jerry's 10 chapters in, I'm 70 in. It goes from not only just that to building a huge world. And I'm not going to give away much of it, but right. you learn a lot more about what the society, what's going on. It's <laughs> an amazing read. I can't, it's one of those, you can't put it down. I mean, the Shonen Jump app is two bucks a month. Exactly. So yeah. That, okay. So I know I said I didn't want recommendations, but I'll throw that on the list. You twisted my arm. <laughs> I, think I mean, um, was it, was there was, there was somebody that commented on our, uh, uh, was it uh, Bill's Analytics? E- either Bill or maybe Mike. I think it was Bill. Um, they commented on and they were just uh, essentially talking about, you know, like with uh, with everything that's going on with um, Viz now. Yeah, I think it was Bill. Um, he was just basically like, yeah, no, so what new stuff uh, are you are you all reading? Mm-hmm. So if you want, you could just, uh, you know, go on to our new Facebook page and you can look and see it, what Sean, I and uh, Bill are reading. Nice. Very cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So uh, again, I oh, can't... no, it was uh, it was Mike. Boy, you're... you are going to learn not to question me. <laughs> boy, yeah. youngin. Boy. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there's there's right. tons of good stuff out there. Yes, All right. Sir. Well, you already talked about a comic. All right. Let's do this. All right. So. <laughs> I already did. <laughs> <laughs> Promise never land. Well, I, okay. I got you. I, our, our round table. Bro. Round table so I wasn't time. I wasn't stepping on you. I was just moving us along. I'm shuffling. <laughs> I'm shuffling. Let's do this. We, got it. we have time constraints right. now. Let's do this. We got it. <laughs> um, so every week we get together, we round table a book. Uh, that means, and this is a book that came out this past week. Um, if you listen to our last show, you know that when we do our independent comic episodes, we're going to be talking about some books that came out uh, a little bit older than a week. So there's no... Always a spoiler warning for that, but this book came out last Wednesday, as always, as our roundtables are want to do. So just heavy, heavy spoiler warning, guys. You haven't read Naomi Number 1 by Brian Michael Bendis, David F. Walker, Jamal Campbell, and Josh Reed, and Jessica Chen, then... Yeah, you might want to like push pause and go read it. But if you've read it by different people, then you can go ahead and listen. Yeah, we're true. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> set me up for failure, Craig. Um, Basically, all right, so, the whole premise of the show, <laughs> uh, pretty much like, how, like let's fuck with Caleb. So <clears throat> before we really dive into the meat and potatoes of the book, what did you guys think, Craig? You like it? Dislike it? Hey, we're going to start with me, huh? So, Always. so the thing Throw about off. this book is, is I really thought it was a well done book. I I thought the art was was well done. I thought the story was good. Um, my issue with it is just pacing. Mm-hmm. It was twenty two pages or whatever a modern comic is now of a setup that I think could have been handled in three pages. But that's just that's me. Uh, I, outside of that, I thought it was really good. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Uh, gorgeous artwork. We'll get in a little bit more about that as uh, Caleb pointed some things out before we start recording. But I think the art's really good. I mm-hmm. really enjoy that. I'm the art guy. That's usually what I rave about first. Uh, depending on what this book is going to be, I'll either agree with Craig or disagree. Because like, if it is going to turn into Naomi being, like, say, a superhero book, if it's going to turn into your standard like superhero book, I agree with Craig. That is a lot of setup. Right. We're going, but how it sets itself up as, I know I'm going to talk over you, kitty. You can't be on the show. <laughs> Got to pay your dues. <laughs> but if it, it's because it sets itself up as a mystery of like Naomi trying to solve something. And if that's more of what this book's going to be about, I'm fine with it being a big setup book. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I so agree. it's to be determined if I agree with Craig or not. TBD. <laughs> yeah. Hashtag TBD. But overall, I think it's a solid number. Uh, first issue overall. Mm-hmm. It's definitely got me curious about where the book's going to go. And like I said, I like the art nice. a whole lot. Yeah, I, I I agree completely. I love the art. I really like what they did with a lot of the page and panel layouts. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just, I, I always really like it whenever they have, um, you know, the characters moving and they, it's a, it's a full scene, but they have it kind of split into panels so you can see like that the characters are moving during it and everything. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I really, really like that. As far as the story, I don't know if I'm like completely hooked, but you know, first issue setup book. We'll see where it goes from there. Uh, we'll see where I am in like, you know, three or four issues. Or something. Nice. So I read the book twice. Uh, the first time I, I completely agreed with what both Jerry and Sean were saying. Really, really loved the art was just taken away by the art. 
And then I, I kind of felt like like I was in the same boat as Craig. I was like, okay, the pacing is a little off. There's it's a little stretched out. I'm not in the, there's some story things here that I think could have been done better. And I didn't care for it as much. I reread it a second time and like my opinion flipped. Uh, I noticed some things in the art that I was not crazy about uh, that really I found to be disappointing. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. And I saw some things in the writing and the script and in the, the just what was happening that I think are some genius moves by Bendis. Uh, and so it kind of kind of switched on it. Uh, I love I love the premise as a whole. It's a book that I'll probably keep reading. Uh, I think it's a fun story. Uh all in all, uh, you know, we don't really do a star. We do a crumple. Craig does a crumple or a rip rating. Um, you know, I, I'd give it a solid three, three, three and a half, four stars. Yeah. I think it was a fun first issue. So let's give people a, a breakdown of what the book kind of is about. Yeah. So there's, it's a small town somewhere on, on the coast. It doesn't say which coast, or at least I didn't pick up which coast it was, but it's a small town on a coast. Um, I'm thinking Oregon-ish. Yeah, it kind of felt like West Coast-ish. It, yeah. it felt Oregon to me. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, a superhero comes to town. There's an event. That's all you know. An event happened in the town. One of the girls happens to be Naomi. Missed the event. She's one of the few people in town that didn't see what happened. Turns out the event was Superman fighting was it Mongol, Mongol, Mongol it I yeah. think. Yeah. Um, and she missed it. And she's kind of sad that she missed it. And everybody else. And she's got the one friend that thinks Superman's a jerk. And. And it goes on, and then he comes back to clean up the mess that he made, which, you know, pretty cool of Superman come back right. and pick up after himself. So then uh, we find out as the story progresses, she's an adopted girl, uh, possibly has Superman syndrome, which means she has the adopt- wants to be Superman because she can relate to him because they're both adopted. And then, you know, she finds out that, a big spoiler, uh, that there was a super well let's back up finds out there was a superhero event in the town before starts yeah, everybody investigating kind of whispers yeah. about it yeah like tones. they either just deny it outright or like they've heard rumors but like some of the older it's an urban legend town. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so yeah so, so it's a mystery yeah so she starts investigating and finds out that the last superhero event happened on the day she was adopted mm-hmm. so that that's the story in a nutshell um and you know Again, it depends on what the book's going to be. To me, this is a love letter to his daughter. It is. For those yeah. of you that don't know, uh, Bendis, Bendis has an adopted daughter that's black. Mm-hmm. And all of this felt like Naomi is his daughter it, to yeah. me. Well, so I don't know what it's like to be adopted, but I, I re- there, there's a lot that happened in this book with the character of Naomi that I completely understand. Like, I, I get. So the whole not being the one person that missed the event. It's kind of a metaphor for when you're growing up in a small town. The town I grew up in had 700 people in it. Uh, And everybody, nothing ever happens in those towns. But everybody feels like something happens to everybody but them. I know what that feels Mm -hmm. like. Other people are having these cool life experiences and you're just stuck. And there are things that are from your past and things that people talk about that you just don't know about or that aren't real. And you're constantly wanting, wanting that to be you. You know, she just wants to meet Superman. She wants to feel that. And the story lays it out perfectly when she's just like, what's what's the word? Special? Yeah, that's yeah. the word. Yeah. Uh, and she just wants to be special. Yeah. And and I I understand that. From, but like you said, from the adoptive point of view, um, Bendis, when Bendis moved over to D.C., a lot of us were worried. A lot of us, you know, because I haven't really necessarily dug on a lot of stuff. Bendis' Marvel work for the past few years. I read Daredevil 619 or whatever it was. <laughs> read that issue of Iron Man. Right. And Iron Man. Was it the one where Da Vinci yeah, came Iron in? Man's yeah. one. The Iron Man's um, one I'm thinking about. It, it wasn't <laughs> great, but... It will never die. But I think, I think Bendis gets Superman on a level that we haven't seen anybody get Superman on, besides maybe Dan Jurgens, for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he understands it. This idea that people keep forgetting... You know, when we think about orphans, when we think about superheroes that have parental issues you think of batman you don't necessarily think of superman but superman he is the poster child for that his he is adoptive he was welcome into a society that's not his own and from from a kid who was adopted like like superman syndrome sums it up perfectly it's not that you want to be superman it's not that you want to be the man of steel or you want to save the world or anything you want to know that it's possible to be accepted into a family that's not biologically your own and to be brought into this world and accepted on a fundamental level. Like that was D and that is Superman. He fucking gets it. 
just nails it. Just from, from the story aspect, and, and I love. I don't know about you guys. Did you guys? What did you guys think about the side characters in this? I liked them. I thought it, <laughs> I liked them a lot, and I think it's going to be a, a big part of it. I think is going to yeah. be her friend, especially. Her, I can't think of the names. I'm going blank right now. Though I read it this morning, <laughs> but her two friends or two core yeah. friends that seem to be around with them. I just like their personalities are like this at opposites, you know, where you always got, you got the moody one in the group and you got the super happy one in the group that annoys everybody <laughs> uh, <laughs> pointing at Jerry for those who can't see us. <laughs> you mean everybody? <laughs> right. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I liked it. And like I said, art wise design too. I like that. They aren't all just cookie cutter women. Like, no, they're, they're uh, different. There's different body types. Yeah, different styles. Yeah. So. so, so one cool thing I liked is, uh, Speaking of side characters, the the one that's a little bit more moody was bitching about uh, Superman not coming back right. and cleaning up the, yeah. the mess he left. And then there's a scene where he comes back and cleans up the mess, and he kind of turns and looks over his shoulder. Caleb doesn't like this panel, but he turns and <laughs> looks over his shoulder and kind of gives a smirk, like, I heard you, yeah, and right, I'm back right. to do this because... Because people forget Superman can literally yep. hear everybody on the freaking planet, which is why I hate Batman versus Superman. But that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's not that I didn't like that. I, I didn't like, you that like panel. the concept of the panel. You just right. I like think the book. concept's brilliant. So this is where this is where we're going to get into a little bit of the art. Um, story wise, I think the last thing we have to talk about is the the mechanic that's in the that's in the book. Yeah, um, yeah. Kind of shows up at, like I get I get why there, and I get like the next issue is going to have him a lot in it. I d- didn't like the introduction of him. It just felt like all of a sudden, like, oh, all of a sudden, there's this person. Yeah, he's just walking by, and oh, by the way, he knows everything. Yeah, I'm she's, gonna go chase him now. Yeah, she, yeah. it's showing a bunch of people in the background, and you kind of see him at his garage, and she's just like, oh, that guy and says his name, and I don't even remember the name off the top Dez of my head or something yeah. like that. And all of a sudden, like, then he's a focal character of the story, and he's this all important person. It just felt like all of a sudden, like there was no introduction to him. It was just like, bam. Well, it was also one of those, he he heard her whispering and looked over his shoulder at her kind of thing. Yeah. Where it's like, oh, I know. So, oh, wait, I gave her yeah. too much information. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's get into the art side of this thing. And I, I got to say, I, I want to reiterate when I first read this book and I was reading through, I snap, I mean, you go on my Instagram page, I put pictures up. But I think the art is gorgeous. It is a fundamentally gorgeous book and it's a Great, great use of the digital medium. Yeah. I, I think so. The second time I read this book, I saw some things that really, they, they bothered me. And not because it's not beautiful, not because it's not a, a mark of quality craftsmanship or artistry, but because I think it's a lazy use of the digital medium. And that's, I mean, like, I, I can't, I can't do this. So I don't want people saying, oh, like, again, when we talk about art, it's, I'm not an artist. So, but the panel that Craig and you guys are talking about where Superman looks over his shoulder and he's kind of smirking. I'm like 80% sure that's a panel from a My Hero Academia. It didn't match the art style at all that was in the book. It looks like All Might. In fact, I was like, I Googled. I was like, what's, yeah. you know, because I feel like I've seen this before. So let me go Google All Might. And I found a GIF and I snapped some screenshots of it where he's doing that same thing. Almost the identical lines. Yeah. You're, that, you're, you're not wrong with that. Once that you bothers that, me. Yeah. Like that because I don't, like, I'm not, I'm not accusing him of stealing somebody else's art. But I will say he cribbed from something really, really heavily for yeah. that moment, and it didn't work for me. It felt, it felt off. Well, the same scene with actually Superman's face instead of All Might's face was yeah. great. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's what I'm saying. Like you could have done that, and and I wouldn't have noticed it. But it feels like all of a sudden they were like, "Oh, let's put this here," and he didn't have a lot of time. He's like, well, "Let me go." Let me go Google a picture. Um, who's maybe maybe Jamal Campbell's reading my hero academia? Like, let me go pull up All Might because All Might's a Superman analog. Let me go pull this up, and then I'll find this picture of me, him looking over his shoulder, which is kind of an iconic picture for the All Might character. And I'm not yeah. even an MHA fan. Like, I'm not you guys. Right. And even I saw that. I'm like, dude, like that's a thing. Um, the other issue I had is in a lot of this book, the backgrounds are recycled. Yeah. I think is the right word for it. Um, and in, in the, uh, so we'll talk about this and this is actually a, a positive thing I want to say about this book. The first, after you get past the first page where there's a, a 12 panel grid with different people talking about the event, because it's classier than a nine panel, <laughs> <laughs> the more, the more grids, the better. And you get the picture of Superman fighting Mongol. If you look in the background, um, there's not a lot there. It's just a lot of explosions and stuff. And you kind of see the church steeple, the clock tower in the background, you turn the page. It's the same thing, but you see more of the town. You see a wrecked uh, fire truck. You see some of the destruction, um, but some of the buildings are still standing. You turn the page again, and there's another spread of kind of that. Sa- it's the same 
artwork laid out, but it's done in a way that it shows you that time is passing. So it's really interesting. I was watching yesterday after the whole Bill Maher thing happened, which is something that we didn't talk about and we can talk about. We'll put it on next month. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, just among ourselves or on the Facebook page or whatever. And so I needed like some positive conversation of the c- comics community. And so I was watching this Frank Miller thing. And Frank Miller was saying ingenious things as Frank Miller's want to do. And this was from like 10 or 15 years ago. And I think he was probably coked out, but it was cool. Um, but <laughs> what? He, he was talking about the, the medium of comics versus the medium of film. And he was saying one thing about film is film directly controls the passing of time because you have the audience at like you're watching a moving screen. Uh, the director, the storytellers, they have the audience at their disposal when it comes to time. You don't have that in the comics medium. On the comic, the, the pages are they're still like you. You have to find creative ways to show the passing of time, and that's why most time people don't use the same backgrounds. They change camera angles or doing this or the other. I, I, Jamal did a fantastic job of of keeping the same visual element. Yeah, it was a yeah. during a, a before, during, and after. Yeah. yeah, did a wonderful job of keeping the same view, the same camera angle, using utilizing the same artwork for the background of. And still showing the passage of time. Like you felt like time right. was moving. And then you flip halfway through the book and you get a picture where uh, the, the main characters are standing in front of a group of people who are all cheering. They're in the act of cheering. And they're having a full conversation and people's hands never move. People's yeah. body positions never move. They Like we're having a conversation right now. There's no point in time to where we're ever not moving after we say a sentence. Right. Right. And in that moment, like I needed, it wouldn't have been hard to go back and you tweak some hands. Right. You you move people a little bit. Maybe you leave some of the characters the same and you shift so, some stuff, stuff up. So I didn't mind the reuse of the of the city background. No, not, I think that was because, well done. I think uh, it was very well done. If you're going to do digital art, why are you yeah. going to redraw the city every damn right. time? I, right. I totally understand that. Reusing the same crowd background right. for four different panels yeah. is lazy. Yeah. To yeah. show it as an entire conversation yeah, passes. Right. And uh, for those who don't know, with, with digital art, you can draw in layers mm-hmm. and using Photoshop, basically. So basically, he could draw, like in this case, the crowd. The crowd with its own layer, and then he would draw, almost like animation, how they have the painted background within the 2D animation to go right. over it. He would draw the background and then make a new layer where he would draw the main character and mm-hmm. speech bubbles and all that, et cetera, et cetera. It wouldn't have been hard to create a new layer on top of the original background layer. And like you said, change the yeah. hands a little bit. And that's what you're complaining. That's what most people do. Right. So it's, was he in a rush with a deadline? Who knows? But yeah, it's like, I didn't notice it at all. But like you said, upon second read, I probably would have picked up on it. Yeah. yeah. But so I like, still like, is it gorgeous art, but there's definitely some shortcuts taken that kind of yeah. deterred a little bit from liking it. But I will say his, the way he emotes, through their face, facial expressions Absolutely. and so yeah. forth is fantastic. Oh, the You've got it on the page is... there, of Naomi kind of uh, getting angry or something, and it was so, uh, there's the detail in their face yeah. mm-hmm. when they're telling a story or talking. You can see the emotions passing their faces yeah. as Absolutely. which, which is something expensive. that's very hard to do in sequential art, but very or not hard to do. I'm not an artist. I don't know. It's <laughs> It's something that's not done really well a lot. Well, it seems to me this, and like I said, I'm not a great artist, but I do draw. <laughs> um, it does seem like a lot of comic book artists don't tend to worry about that. They think the writing is expressing all emotion. All they got to do is the same kind of standard grimace face or happy face. But like when you get the ones that like, and I could go on a list if I just did a little bit of reference. I know there's like many artists who are like just known for that, really mm-hmm. getting into the expressiveness of a face, which is really even more than the words can show because it's, you know, you're reading the words, but the face, if you construe, you know, just change the eyebrows up a little bit, you know, squint the eyes. Yeah. For me, face, it's in the eyes. It'll, yeah, it's a, it'll, that'll give you the tone of the text you're reading. And I think, yeah. I don't think a lot of artists think about that. Yeah. And this, this person absolutely does. Like I said, I, shortcuts aside, like, and not a use, you said the same thing, regardless, it's beautiful. Artwork. It's, it, it's stunning. Like, I, even if it, even if there's some things I have to take if, issue with as a person yeah. who reads it, it's absolutely beautiful. And there's a panel in here where it shows the ass end of a Corvette Stingray <laughs> that I like. <laughs> it looks like what is the the artist Bingle that's doing the book with Remender um, right now? And I forget what the book's called. Um, Death or Glory, I think it is. Oh. Um, he draws some of the most amazing cars. Like this looks like like that panel looks like Bingle. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I think Bingle draws some of the best cars in comics today. Uh, so all in all, um, yeah, it's a good book. It's absolutely, I, I'm looking forward to the second issue. I want some more of the mystery. Um, 
And I think it sounds like you guys kind of feel the same way. I'm contemplating running over because the, our local comic book shop only had three copies, which I think went to all three of you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm contemplating running over there after this and probably grabbing up the first issue. And I'll, I'll save you the time. You can just have mine, man. Well, yeah, okay. I, I, I'm good with it. I'll just read it on digital next time. Like I, This is a book I'm not really crazy necessarily need to collect full time. I'm thinking about jumping on uh, it, though. Man. Okay. Please yeah. give it a second issue and see. Yeah, I'll see let you borrow mine, let you flip through it, man. Cool. Um, well, all right. Um, yeah, and I'm, that's. I will stick through the first story arc and see. I think she's going to end up being a superhero because it's the part of the Young Justice right. group. So, but I think there's going to be a mystery for the story, first story arc eventually. Right. Yeah, this is the the Wonder Comics imprint, and in the Wonder Twins book in that imprint as well. Like, oh yeah, that's what he's doing. He's we'll like be young. able to talk about the Wonder Twins next month and the uh, <laughs> the controversy going on with that. <laughs> oh lord! Yeah, oh, of course. <laughs> I'm ready for Dial H. Yeah, that one looks good as well. It feels weird not moving on to like us talking about like our books of the week. Right, I'm trying right. to have to stop ourselves. But we're not doing that because that's coming up next episode. Uh, and we hope that you guys come back for that because it's going to be a fun one. Um, I've already got a stack of books I've got to decide on when we uh, expand it past the you know the one week of books. Now I've got a stack of stuff I have to figure out what I'm talking about. Yeah, for sure. Um, but as always, Wednesdays are new comic book day. Uh, I'm really excited about some of the books that are coming out. Uh, what about you guys? Who uh, I think, Craig, what are you reading next week, buddy? I've got Fight Club 3 down. The Dark Horse Comics. <laughs> Fuck. Is that what you were going to choose? Yep. I thought <laughs> you might. Uh, Marla Singer is about to give birth to her second child. Only this one is fathered by Tyler Durden instead of by the narrator. Same DNA, right? Uh, yeah. But the, the personality. Right. Oh. So will this, will this child inherit Tyler's Earth? Oh. I'm excited about this, and I got to say, I don't know if, if you didn't read, if you're a fan of Fight Club and you didn't read Fight Club 2, it is a sequel to the film. Yeah, so yeah like, absolutely. Yeah, this is a sequel to that. Written by the same guy. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing. It's it's just the direct sequel, and if you missed out on it. I was uh, going to say the guy's name, but I can't. It's Chuck P. That's what I call pa- him. Palachuk or Palanuk or Pahul- Palanuk. Pahul- yeah. Well, if you don't like the way we pronounce your name, feel free to come on this show and fight club us. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't want to be fight club. You can't, you can't talk about it, remember? Oh, well, well, we just won't record it, but he can still come talk to us. Uh, I'm, I, because you, Craig took mine. To go? Uh, yeah, to go? go and let me catch up. Right, I'll play, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. playing the back end. Uh, book I'm looking forward to next week oh, is I, the ever-expanding mystery of Heroes in Crisis. Uh, we're getting issue number five, and like I said, it's been a... Just that slow reveal process that I really like, and Tom King has just masterfully kept me interested this whole time. And this one's going to be more uh, going to focus on uh, Batman and Flash inve- investigating the mystery. So we're going to get a little focus on them for this one, I think. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. Jerry, what do you got? Balls. Was that, was uh, that, he, that your pick? Did he take yours? <laughs> did I take yours? No. Oh. Um, you just didn't have one. Yeah. Because you're uh, Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, it's me. Well, here, while you're looking that up, I'll go. I found another right. one. I'll just, I'm, okay. a, I'm, I'm going to go back to my pool list. This is something that I've been reading that I've absolutely been loving. Um, I think we talked about the first issue. Uh, the series has been great. I know, I know my girl Wendy uh, from Double Page Spread Podcast has been just eating this story up. It's Man Eaters number five by <laughs> Chelsea Kane. And again, another name that I'm going to f- fail miserably at. Kate Niemzik uh, from Image Comics. Um, so if you haven't been reading it, Man Eaters exists in a world. Uh, it's kind of like Ginger Snaps when young women uh, they they get their periods, they start developing, they hit puberty, they go through hormones. They actually turn into werecats <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and eat people. So the government has developed a. They don't do that in real life. Uh, no, oh. uh, no, I mean I don't I don't know. At least not that I know of. <laughs> Caleb doesn't. Caleb know is the only one surviving. I just wanted his reaction. To that. <laughs> um, I hear those things have teeth. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> They, no, uh, there is a movie word. Yeah, don't ever <laughs> mention that movie again. <laughs> <laughs> um, the government kind of creates a like a way to restrain them or to keep them from going through that. It changes. Uh, it's 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 a metaphor. The, the book is, and it's a very well done metaphor about women's rights and the rep- repression of women and how things that are absolutely natural and happen to every woman are considered nasty and we just don't want to talk about it. Like when women get their periods, a lot of people just are like, you say that word, I pass out, I go out in the van and I pass out tampons and pads to people all the time and they'll just, even the women will whisper like, you know, I, I need from like, no, you need tampons, you need pads. Like, what? You, like it's a thing, it happens. We're yeah. cool with it. Like, let's move past this. Right. Uh, and yeah. so I'm, I'm loving the book. I really can't, like, so issue five comes out this next week. A uh, little bittersweet, uh, Sparrowhawk number four comes out, and we've mm. only got one more issue after this. Oh. 
Yeah, and I just I really feel like they could have stretched this into at least a ten or twelve <clears throat> issue. I bet series. it comes back with another series. I really, really hope that they do. Um, because it just feels like there's so much more story here to tell because they're still in this fantasy world that we don't know everything about. Right. And then they still have to deal with this uh the fairy queen and everything that's probably wreaking havoc in her world. Um I bet that I bet that's a book that's issued in mini series forms. I, um, I, October I Factions so. the same way. Right. It's been a bunch of mini series. Yeah. Right. That's the Magnolia uh, thing. Yeah. But yeah, I I'm I'm down to see what they do this next uh next issue. Um and I'm sad that I only have one more issue after this one. <laughs> we'll find you we'll find you another one, buddy. Yeah. I got faith in us. <laughs> well, is uh we ready to bring this or is is we I is word we, good. Oh, God, God damn it. Are we ready to bring this thing home, fellas? And he's the one with the college education. I ain't graduated yet. They may take it away. <laughs> That's how he's going to end every court case. <laughs> Is we done with the thing? <laughs> yes. All right. Yes, we well, are. let's do this. Well, everybody, we we appreciate you listening to us for the last hour and a half or so. Uh, we have a great time doing it every week. Again, these episodes, if you've been listening, you know they drop every Sunday. We absolutely love doing them. We love your input. We love hanging out with you guys, talking to you. Come to our Facebook page, our, our group. Jump on there. You can post things as you. It's great. It's a new thing thing that we're doing it's wonderful come geek uh, yeah it's it's fantastic we really love it we invite you there see what we're posting see what we're reading uh, just a bunch of different stuff on our instagram pages we're talking on twitter or at sfg podcast on both of those sean's keeping the youtube page going hot and heavy we're having a lot of fun this is this has been a great year doing this podcast we've met so many new friends that we genuinely consider friends and we really love it if you have any comments questions or concerns shoot us an email we're southern fried geekery at gmail.com and I guess if we don't have anything else, fellas, go forth and love some comics. Woo! But you aren't doing it anymore. I did. <laughs> As this is <was> wrong. <laughs> <laughs>